Welcome back, everyone. Okay, I'll, I'll send um, afterwards. As I say, we're going to have a panel discussion in a moment. Just a, a, a couple of reminders. One is that there's the opportunity to eat together afterwards and continue the conversations which are taking place. Um, and that will be in the Philippi Lounge. Um, if you haven't brought something with you, but you would like to join that, then there, are, there is some extra um, in the fridge. So um, you'd be able to come and join. I have um, if I can't hear him. We've had a reading, which is what we would do in a service. Um, but we also are going to confess together. Now, this morning may have laid on your heart certain things that you may want to lay before the Lord. It is a general confession, um, which I'm pleased to lead. So the words will come up on the screen. And we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, for our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Jesus died on the cross that we might be forgiven. For all those who truly repent today, which means to turn away from sin and to turn to Christ, may we receive that forgiveness today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, just a reminder. Bijoy Pao who is not only the Chief Executive of the Ascension Trust, but also your trustee of MJR. You're involved with MJR. Just a supporter. Just a supporter. We have Bishop Rosemary, um, Bishop of Croydon, and Reverend Les Isaacs, former CEO of the Ascension Trust. Your panel. <laughs> and I have the wonderful privilege and opportunity in keeping these guys in check and make sure that they behave each other. Um, but I just want to um, kick us off by saying thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you for, for watching this film. It's a very powerful story and very powerful narrative that is shared. Um, and we hope that this discussion enables the conversation to go on. Because I, for me personally, I believe it's something that we as a church, and I don't just mean Christ Church, I mean church with a large C, have been silent on for too long. And it's an opportunity for us to bring the conversation into the light, because it's only in light that we can find true freedom, as that's what Jesus did for us. He brought us light, so we can illuminate the darkness and say, no more, not on our watch. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to kick us off with an easy question um, and then go very, very hard. So guys, I hope you're ready. Thank you very much. And the easy question is, what would you say are some of the key themes that emerged from the film for yourself? Um, Doug, why don't you go first? Just how much wrong has been done. I mean, it opens the eyes to some of the wrong thinking, some of the wrong action. Uh, and just how far back it goes as well, and how close it comes to modern day as well. And Bishop? The key theme is on, for me, repentance and on reconciliation. Um, it's, it's a powerful telling of history and it's a factual telling of history, so it lays bare um, uh, what has happened. But I think it gives that sense of journeying and focus on going forward. So it's not just history to, to sit there and then to lay blame and wait, but actually it's a telling of history to say, how now can we make a difference? How can we all together, all people, 
and I love our confession, how can we all come together in reconciliation through repentance so that we can move forward as the people of God? So that's for me. Thank you. And part, yeah, yeah I, I think for me, the film speaks about creating a space for us as a church to really get hold of, you know, some things that we were part of, which was quite destructive, and how we as a church could repent of it and how we could move forward with it. I think it creates a space for us to face the truth. And the Bible says the truth shall set you free. But also, what this film has done is, is to really show me the level of um, ignorance there are across the church about history and our involvement. And the beauty of this film, it doesn't point. I tell people, it's not a Malcolm X kind of film. It really is a film that creates space for us to come in and says, come on, come in and really let's talk. Let's talk and let's seek to address it. That's what this film does for me. And it's doing as I watch and listen to people at various audiences. Great, thank you. Um, just a reminder, I will be opening up the, the questions to the audience. So please think about anything that you do want to ask the panel. Um, and don't, don't feel afraid to hold back. Like, please, please ask whatever is on your mind. Um, so my second question is, in the, face of, in the face of racial injustice, what outrages you the most? And what vision drives you to keep going? I'll, I'll start with you, Les. Mm. I think for me, at times it's quite disheartening. It's the fact that the truth is there and that people are not willing to engage with the truth. I had a conversation with some folks and they were saying, well, I can't get my head around it. And I'm saying, which part of it you can't get your head around? <laughs> you know, which part? Explain to me which part of it. And I think for me, it drives me because I'm passionate about Jesus. I'm passionate about the cross and that the cross is all about the redemptive work, you know, that Jesus did on the cross for us, for us. And I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic because of the power of redemption that's in the cross. So that keeps me going. Um, I do, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Bijo and I have just come back from the Caribbean. And I still, after being in this country 57 years, I do feel, why am I going back to England? Why am I? And it's not about the sun. It's about, you know, it's about the what I see is happening through institutional racism when I see young black men and women, people of color, and they have the aptitude, the ability to make a difference and they're being kept down. I see it. I know it. I hear it. That kind of thing disheartened me, but my faith says, keep going. Thank you. And Bishop Rosemary. Uh, just to come straight from that, I think what outrages me the most is that the, the, the racism persists. It persists, and that in so many ways, it's people, many people try to say it's not really a big issue because look how many people of color there are in this place and that place and the other place. But the reality is, for even people who are in those seemingly high places or powerful places, you still know, I still know, that when I leave my house in the morning, I am viewed by my color. I know that. And I know that someone sometime will say something to me on the basis of my skin color, which tells me I am not as good as another person. And that is there. So that's still, and I think, so that's why I come back to our confession where we all come before God and we all say we have sinned against you and our neighbor. And I think it's that that I think that we need to get our heads around. Racism continues. 
it is real, and that racism that has insidiously woven its way into all our institutions and into our beloved church is part of the reason why, as Pastor Les says, we still have so much institutional racism now in our society. So I think, and my, why I'm the lead for racial justice in the diocese is because this has been something that once I realized it, I've been fighting for it. And I just want to say to you all, that was my home that you saw on screen. Many of those images, you could almost see the small chattel house, which is a two-room house that I was born in. My mother worked on the plantation as help. My parents and grandparents were born into that plantation slavery that we witnessed there. So it's very much part of who I am. But as Les says, the journey for me is the journey of faith. And it is the knowledge that our Lord Jesus Christ died to free us. And I feel that I've been freed and given the responsibility and the opportunity to try to work with others to open the space so we can really be our, each other's brothers and sisters. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I too love Jesus and love the cross and I see Jesus revealed in scripture. Um, and it was a last minute decision to include some readings today. I thought well, it's, a, it's a kind of a service, so it should have a kind of a reading. Um, at the 8.45 uh, service, which happened before, um, Richard spoke very powerfully on um, those two passages that we had. Um, and I said to him, it's, it's Racial Justice Sunday, choose some passages and preach on it. And of course, the first passage was that we are all made in the image of God. And the second passage was, um, when you hear these words, put them into practice. Yeah. So I thought they were perfect readings for today. Um, and what outrages me is that that is not how the church has behaved. Well, thank you. Um, Doug, you've attended something called the Black Light Course. Can you tell us more about that mm. and kind of what you found from it yourself? Yeah. Um, Okay, I love what you said, Les, about the yeah, having openings for reconciliation. <clears throat> and being a white leader of a mixed-race church um, and around the early conversations that we had that weren't early enough, as you know, um, around race, the early advice I had was, um, you're white, you're privileged, there's nothing you can do about it. And the Black Light course was the first time, um, and Les, you, you led on that first session as well, um, that it was, this is about moving forward. Um, and it's eight sessions, I think. Um, what I, I did was I wrote a blog after each one, so that's all out there, and we can make that available. I summarized it in the news link this week. I think it was that perspect those perspectives of how much what we receive is Eurocentric, um, is you know, the, the, the growth of Christianity across the world and, and through some of the means that we've heard today, um, made these kind of European assumptions about a book which is very little of it is actually based in Europe. Um, it's Middle Eastern and African. Um, African theologians in the first two or three centuries who we learn about in college, but we don't say, this is an African um, theologian, this is, a, this is somebody in, in Italy or whatever. We're just going to go, well, with this name and that name. And actually, how much of a black influence there is in the theology that we receive and in the Bible that we read. Um, and I, I thought that was, that was really enlightening, and it gives a different perspective um, about your own assumptions. Um, it doesn't necessarily change how we read every bit of the scripture, but it gives a depth which I didn't have going in. And would you encourage other people to attend the course? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, as with any anything, it's going to be a bit mixed as to yeah. how people receive it, but um, if this is something that you're interested in finding out more about, 
um, and being challenged to change your view, mm -hmm. then I would strongly recommend doing Black Light Clause. Okay, time to go deep and time to go heavy. Could, could I just say something before that? Um, 26 years ago, myself and a guy called Dr. Stuart Murray, who was a lecturer at Spurgeon's College, um, we met together and we started off talking about um, urban mission. We were talking about how do we do evangelism and share the gospel in a city that's becoming more and more cosmopolitan, multiracial. So that is how the concept starts. And how do we deal with all the issues of, that an urban context bring in terms of culture, race, and us getting across our message? So that was the backdrop to black light. So we thought, well, actually, how do we educate one another about history? Because if you're unaware of people's journey, it means that you're not going to, you'll be talking to them, but you're going to be talking from your context, your perspective, and your history. And so you'll be over people's head. So the Black Light course is a toolkit to help you, if you're passionate about Jesus, and let me just say, I'm passionate about Jesus, not because I'm black, okay? <laughs> right? I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about Jesus because I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I've been baptized. I've been filled with the Spirit, and I've got anticipation of getting to heaven one day, but it started here already, and I'm going to get to that final New Jerusalem. And so for me, you need something to help you so that when you meet people, you're not embarrassed. You don't feel embarrassed about talking the truth with confidence. So that's how Black Lives Matter. So I would really encourage you, get on it. Sit in your front room and have a cup of coffee. Take note. Go afterwards. Have discussion with Doug, your vicar, and others, so that when you meet people from Africa or Asia or wherever they're from, you could have a serious conversation and get to the point of Jesus and the redemptive work of the cross. Thank you. Could I add one more thing? This sort of something yeah. struck me from the, uh, from the film which is that phrase um, when uh, some reformers wanted to make slavery more Christian. Mm. And that really struck me as a phrase because more Christian is not Christian. It's not following the, the, the teachings of Jesus. Mm. It's not showing the model of Jesus. It's tinkering with something. And I think that informs our action, which is that it follows the model of our Lord and Saviour. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and just to highlight, um, the next Black Light course starts in May, um, and all the information will be made available through the news link and the church website for anybody who wants to attend. Um, okay, so audience... It's an online course. It is an online so course, so you can sit from the comfort of your own living room or wherever you have Wi-Fi. So if that means Starbucks or Costa, then by all means you can do it from there <laughs> as well. Um, how has the church enabled a racist narrative in its Christian teachings today after what we've seen about how it did it through history? I, I think, you know, what, what we've got to remember, there's power at play. We've got to remember that. There's power. Um, I, I did some research on um, a guy called Raymond Backey, Dr. Raymond Backey, and he was looking at the Chicago context and seeing what people group brings to the city. And he identified the Italians, the Poles, the Blacks, and, and the Irish. And it was interesting in his research about the Irish, he said the Irish got it right. He said this, the Irish understood the power of power. So when the Irish settlers came, they encouraged their constituency, their community, to become police officers. Power. They encourage, they encourage them to become politician. So in the police service, you had the O'Malley's, the O'Reilly's, power. You had the Kennedy's, power. But more importantly, they encourage them to become priests. And he defines that what you call the urban trinity: <laughs> power, influence, dominance. And so we have to understand that the church. Part of the church understood power. And because of its power base, it wanted these things to continue because if you broke that, you're going to undermine its power. 
So it continues up until this day because there is something in people's mind, not the kingdom of Jesus, it's about an institution that says we still want to be powerful. That's how it's continued up until this day. That sounds like a conversation I was having with George and Peter outside where I was saying that the church from the third century on became one of the institutions of the state. Um, it's not a, whether the Church of England is established. That's not that what we're talking about. We're talking about the church. And I suppose if I would have a slight critique, I think the Church of England gets it in the neck in this film. When, because when people talk about the church, they just then make that the Church of England. Now, I know in the context of the United Kingdom, we can have that conversation. But quite honestly, the church is the church, and it's wider than that. And powerful institutions like the church, whether it's Methodist or Baptist or Church of England, Protestant, Catholic, power is what has generated that sense of differentiation and marginalization. And it is not, like, again, the question was, we didn't get it right with regard to race and color. How are we not getting it right today with regard to other marginalized groups? And, and that's, a that's a conversation we were having. So it's about power and it's about agency. And the thing that the church can give, and, 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 and it is very powerful, is agency. So when the church can get it right, and I believe it can, it gives agency to people of all abilities, all colors, all genders, all capacity to be involved and to be part of the, the, the journey of fellowship and discipleship and evangelism and growing our faith. And everybody has a right and a responsibility. And I was saying to George's daughter how wonderful it was to see young people as part of the leadership of worship in the, in, in the church, because that's what we need to see. That's the journey forwards. So, so for me, it is about power. It's also about agency. And it's also about our understanding how power works in our institution. And then working, it's a fourth mask of mission. It's working then to transform unjust structures. That's what it's about. And we all have the ability by enabling ourselves to grow in knowledge and understanding of the power we have, because we all have power and we all have agency. But are we using our power well? And are we taking up the agency that being people of God, Christian people, gives us? The institution may block us, but how do we find the ways that we can take responsibility for the agency we've been given as disciples of Christ? Uh, well, I see here is somebody who's under the authority of a black woman. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a pleasure. Um, you describe me as a, a pugilist for my <laughs> curate, yes. and that wasn't because you're black or because you're a woman, it's because I disagreed with you. <laughs> um, and we've had wonderful conversations since. Um, I think that's a serious point, actually. I mean, you, you have moved up the greasy pole, and it is a greasy pole in the Church of England. We wish it wasn't, but it is. Um, and bless you and, you know, wish you well in that. Um, there should be more of that. Um, we have PCC elections coming up soon. They are open to absolutely anyone in the church. And I would like to say that, that moving into that position gives agency. It should give agency. And if we've ever done that badly in the past, then we repent of that because that should not be the way. The other thing I would say is that we um, ran a course here uh, called Christianity Explored, and it was in partnership with the church which meets across the way. We couldn't alive City Church, it was a, a black majority church. But I emphasize that word, it was a partnership. It, they didn't have premises, so I said, do it here, we'll do it together. Then we don't need to charge you for it. Um, and we worked together, and it was a wonderful time. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's thinking of each other as brothers and sisters, but also partners in what we do. I think that's, you know, 
the intentionality of whether a PCC or a vicar or anyone to understand um, the dynamics and the history of what's happening. So I say to leaders, okay, you've got people of color in your church. How are you helping them to think through, to, you know, to level up or to get those skills? And not, not, more often it's not the skill, it's the confidence. Mm -hmm. Because for many people who are uh, in the minority, they have the skills. Some of them have got triple, multiple degrees. But, you know, sometimes they lack the confidence. And how intentional are we about getting beside people and saying, you know, I've seen something in you, and I want to bring you up. When I came into faith, the two, people, two persons who really helped me was a Welsh guy, a Welsh minister, and an Irish minister. And, um, you know, really incredible. And I had to think through that. I said, maybe it was because it was the Welsh history with the English or the Irish, you know. So both of them, you know, they had some affinity with me. But what they did, they saw the potential in me. And they were very intentional of bringing me on. So he started off with, I want you to preach Sunday evening. And, you know, the preachers start, you know, preach for 20 minutes. I preached for four minutes, and that was it. He said, that's very good. Next month, you're going to speak again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those kind of space to make, help people to get confidence and to bring out their gifts. So, you know, I think one of the key things is that churches, you know, leadership or industry have to be very intentional about meeting people halfway. Mm -hmm. It's not that they haven't got the intelligence, but they need the confidence. And I just say, it's not meeting them halfway. It's meeting them where they are. Yeah. It's meeting them where they are. Jesus met people where they were. He didn't tell them to come towards me and then I'll come to you. He, he, he found them and then he raised them up. And I think that's what I meant about the age, the intentionality and then the capacity for agency. Because, same story, it was my vicar, a white vicar, who first said to me, I think, I think you're called to be a minister. And I told him, yeah, and I think you probably had a, a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. <laughs> like many people who, the calling comes upon them and often they don't see it. Some people do. They see it like, like um, Paul on the road to Damascus. But for many of us, it's something insidious and it's someone else that helps us to see what the opportunity and possibilities that God has laid out for us is. And it's not about that it has to be a person of color that taps the shoulder of a person of color. No, I don't believe in that kind of ghettoism. I think we all have agency and responsibility and we should use that with intentionality to encourage um, all people to, to live into their gifts because um, they're God-given. Definitely, and I'm, I'm, I'm living proof of that and, and this family. This has been my home now for 20 years and I can point to more than half the members who are sitting in front of me who have given me that faith, who have given me that investment, given me that time, that opportunity to, to thrive. And, and like, uh, I'm glad to call you my family because that is what you are to me. And that's what, what it means for me to be able to be here, to be able to be with these incredible men and women and yourselves. Because we're family, we can have these conversations. We can have these discussions, no matter how hard it is or how easy it might be. But it's family that creates the space for this to be heard. Um, and with that, I'd like to open the floor for my family to, to ask any questions. Does, does anybody have anything that w they were touched by in, in the film or by anything that's been shared so far or anything that they would like to, to ask any of us panelists at all? I've got a magnificent runner who is um, <laughs> due some athletic training, so please make it go <laughs> as hard and fast as you can. So if there are any questions. Hello, I'm Ben. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, how we can put in strategies to help um, people of color into leadership more easily than they currently uh, do. I, I want to maybe understand some of the barriers a bit more. 
um, e- either at this church level, I'm talking leading worship or leading a children's group, um, or in the organizations that each of you are, are involved with and how we can do more to promote leadership. Um, if, if I can start. Um, I think, and I, I will talk very specifically about Christchurch now. Um, for, for years, I think we've been really great at recognizing people who have gifts and have skills and have talent and putting them in the right positions to serve. However, we've not been very good at recognizing people who have got passion and drive and determination, but don't necessarily have the skills or the opportunities. And I think leaders, um, both at the um, church leadership, but also ministry leads and leads within house group, I think we need to take some time to step off frontline delivery look for those people and actually invest some time in them to say, I see your passion, let's equip that so that actually you can then serve and give them the space to then serve. Whilst I think that's true of um, specific, uh, specific members of our community, I think that's true across all our congregation members. There are so many opportunities to serve within Christchurch but not enough people are aware of those opportunities. So it's raising awareness, looking for the spark that someone says, actually, that's where my heart's at, and then getting alongside them to equip them. I think that's part of the start of that journey. Um, I'd just like to amplify that and say, you can take it out of, um, out of this church and you can put it across any institution. Mm. It, it is, again, that's what I was saying, it is that, that, that opening our eyes and our ears to really look in and listening um, to people and, and, and recognizing that um, the, the opportunity and the, the, the capacity in, in folk. Because people won't necessarily bring themselves forward. I remember when I was um, a parish priest, I encouraged um, one of our young people to be, he was 25 at the time, to be the church warden. He'd never thought that that was ever something that anybody would ever ask him to do, ever. You know, and I, and I just got alongside him. I spent my first year just encouraging him and just saying what, what it involved and how he could be a real beacon for our young people in church if he could stand forward and take leadership. And so he, he watched the, the, the other person, and it was an age thing. It wasn't a colour thing because the, 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 you know, the warden before him was, a, was a, an older black man. So it was an age thing. I wanted to bring forward young people to be part of the leadership. And he was a young black man himself. And so, um, and so he did for a year, and then he kind of shadowed, and he was mentored, and then he stepped forward, and he became the church warden. And it was, um, for him, some of the proudest moments of his life to be able to say that he was part of the leadership of the church. So I think we just need to constantly encourage, but not just encourage, mentor, intentionally mentor and intentionally look out for those who might just hide behind the pillar. Because there'll always be the people that come forward and you see them, they shine bright. But there's the ones who hide behind the pillar and say, oh, not me, I could never do that. Well, how can we help them be whatever God's calling them to be and, and stop the kind of hiding without embarrassing them, without making them be what we want them to be and, and, and not what they want to be, but just encouraging them to see their own gifts and abilities and talents. And if people of colour we're talking about at this time specifically, but my, my message has always been about everybody, and I've got a passion for young people, as you've probably heard. So it's a passion to get young people right up front in the leadership of our church, whether it's playing music, whether it's being a youth leader, and I think I started up the first youth warden scheme in the Church of England and in the diocese, so whether it's being a youth warden, whatever it is, being part of the, the leadership, encouraging people. So that's what I would say to you, it's right. I, I think um, it's interesting, in the football world, they have scouts, and they go out on mm. Saturday or Sunday, and those guys and women are looking for potential they have certain criteria. In industry, you have headhunting firms, 
and the industry, I, I need that person. And we see in the world all kinds of model that says, what will make somebody, um, what kind of personality, character, skills that we need? What are the criteria? I think that we have to become more intentional about these things, because one of the things I've found in a church, we tend to sort of have a department for the kingdom, whereby we allow Jesus, oh, well, Jesus will sort all of that out. He will sort whether you've got ministry out. He will sort whether your skills and gifts. And our industry, when we're, when we're in the world, we're very professional, we're very slick and smart. I think that it's important for us to recognize that our abilities and skills that we have for the world, we need to bring them in the context of the church and the kingdom. So, for instance, when I meet people, and I travel all over the place and I meet people, I'm always trying to discern how can I help that person. They've got a passion, they're intelligent, they're gifted, there's potential. Where do I fit them in? You know, and I say, give me a number. And the reason why I ask them for their number, because I'm thinking that person will be good for the kingdom. I'm not sure where they fit now, but I know that person will be good for the kingdom. I think just like the scout or the headhunter, we have to develop that in the church, in the kingdom, we've got to look and say to ourselves, wow, what gifts in that person? What skills in that person? It was interesting because, you know, in the organization, Ascension Trust has been going for 30 years now. And, you know, we've got a board there. We've got president of international company. We've got former head teachers, um, theologians, all kinds of people on the board. They're, you know, these are people at the top of the game in, in, their, in their lives. And it was interesting as we were looking about who would be the next CEO. The first thing they said, let's get a consultant in and help us to think through what we need to do. So they took this approach. Let's get a consultant in. Let's put to a consultant what we're looking for and let them give us some feedback. And it was really amazing. After a year of doing that, the chairman and I met together and we were talking about you know, this and that. And then we talk, I said, chairman, have you thought about B-Joy? And, you know, this chairman, you know, and he's a guy that's all over the world, you know, when you ring him, where are you, Australia, India, America, blah, blah, you know, and he says, wow. And automatically begins to think, the present, the future. Les, you represent the past. Where's the future? Mm. And he was thinking so strategically about the future. And then he began to think, okay, what skills has B-Joy got? You know, what potential? What has he done before? He was asking all the right questions. And the board just helped develop that. And so you develop those things and you get confidence and then you begin to say to yourself, okay, what do we do to ensure that he thrives? You see? So he hasn't got this, he hasn't got that, he's got this, he's got that, but what can we do to make sure it's right? Because he's got all the chemistry that it needs to go. So I think strategically, the church has got to be more like that. Those business people, those people with those kind of thinking have got to say to the vicar, you know, I've been thinking the other day, I've seen so-and-so, and this is my views, and I want to just give it to you, just to help the vicar or the PCC think. And as we are strategic like that, then we see more people coming up. And I want to say this, with the kingdom, you're raising people up, not necessarily for your congregation, you're raising up for the kingdom. So the Anglican Church will benefit, and maybe other denominations may benefit, but, but you're raising people up for the kingdom of God. And once we've got that, I think that we, we're on a good road. Thank you. Hello there, my name's Tom. Something that struck me in this film, which I'd already read about, looking about um, uh, the, how post-slavery unraveled in the United States, was how quickly the, the power organizations arranged laws, regulations, I mean, segregation to start, although that's mostly disappeared perhaps, how they quickly arranged things to make sure that power, influence, and above all, cash stayed in the same hands so that people who had been slaves were freed, um, sort of, but they never got the cash. And 
So my question is about money. As individuals, we, we buy things, we spend money, we use banks. And as a church, we spend money. I know because I do maintenance contracts that only one or two smaller contracts have been let with black-owned businesses. So my question is to ask, how do, we address the, how do we address the colossal wealth gap in Britain between white and black people, which it is enormous, you can look it up. Can we address that by our own direct actions in seeking to place business with black-owned businesses? Well, I think you've kind of answered the question that you've asked. So, uh, so I think it's a put out there um, to, to say that, that reparations, which is the conversation and partly what you're, what you're speaking to, I think perhaps I always want to drop another statistic or a fact into this conversation. But you know, you saw in the film where it said that um, after the slaves were freed, there was this 40 million pound, yes. 40 million pound that was paid um, to the slave owners? 40, it was 40%, 40, 40 of, the of, GDP. of the government's yeah. GDP. Sorry, I knew there was 40 in yeah. there. We only finished paying that in 2015. We, we only finished paying that in 2015. That is, every taxpayer in this country has been paying back that debt. That is, every taxpayer. That is, people like me the child of the child of the child of the child of plantation slavery, paid back that debt in 2015. So, the answer to your question is, I always say, what we, if we're going to talk about reparations, part of it is about money, and as you may have heard and probably will have heard, the Church of England is starting a bit of a conversation in terms of the 100 million that it is um, going to be using as part of the reparations conversation, but it's only the beginning of it, not, it's not the end of it. However, reparations is not just about cash, it's also about the way in which we can use the agency we have, and that's part of the agency we have, to also enable um, pe people's lives to be changed. And one of the ways we can do that is in investing in the communities around us, in the businesses and around us, in the way in which we might say, well, I want to raise up people from um, a community that's been underprivileged, and I don't want to pull one, but we might say, so I'm going to really invest in, in helping people with learning difficulties, and I'm going to really see what I can do to encourage that community to by, by putting in my support. I think that we can do this, but not in a way that's just a gesture or token. I think we have to um, investigate it. We have to make sure that we are taking all our proper risk assessments. We do the right things, but we do intentionally say we are going to enable our business mindset in the same way the Church of England says it's, it's, you know, it's ethically investing, this could be a way of ethically investing also, another facet of ethical investment. So I think you're absolutely right, and I think we should be encouraging that form of ethical and moral investment. Yeah. I just want to follow on from you, Bishop. Um, it's interesting, fair trade came to mind, mm -hmm. okay? And, and many churches bought into fair trade because they understood the injustice and the, and the way that the people on the ground were being exploited. And I think it's key. I think as a congregation, you could be saying to yourself and to your PCC, to your bigger PCC, okay, how are we going to do this? What's the best method for us to be part of this conscious investment? Mm -hmm. So you could be saying to yourself as a church, actually, we want to intentionally, either we're going to invest money or we're going to support because a lot of it we think of young people um in schools not being educated properly and not you know when you look at the whole education system it's suspect it's questionable because of still the lack of um, young people coming through and going to further education when you think about um the, what you mentioned with jobs we could be intentional about hey okay we've got some contracts how, many, how are we going to reward these contracts? How many black businesses are we going to make sure get this contract? And you're not getting them because they're black. You're getting them because they're quality, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. But they're also black as well. So I think for me, it's about the church really sitting down 
And this doesn't happen one Sunday afternoon after church. This is a process where you are thinking it through, praying it through, working through. But at the end of it, you could say, we are being intentional and specific. And we could say, over the years, we have done this as part of our contribution in terms of reparation. <coughs> Doug, anything to comment? I'm humbly listening. <laughs> as the chair of PCC is to how this conversation goes. Um, yeah, that's been very helpful. Thank you. Um, I think we've got space for two more questions. Um, and five hands go up. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. one's got the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, good, morning. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Nash. Um, and I had a few thoughts and comments um, in relation to us some of the things that have been said, particularly by the panelists in relation to, uh, one word that stick to mind was uh, intertwined and intentional. Um, and so what I wanted to ask was, do we know how racism is intertwined, whether locally, nationally, within our borough area, and what that looks like in the manifestations? I think yourself over there mentioned representation, you, you mentioned about resources. So do we fully understand um, how, it, how racism is manifesting? And then do we understand if we do implement something or if we are implementing anything, the impact of that, the, the, the data, and that doesn't mean necessarily quant, quant, quantitative data, you know, qualitative data as well of the impact of the, some of the things that we're doing. So just wanted to get, I guess, a, a better picture of how, of how we are untangling in an intentional way. I mean, speaking for where we are at the moment, um, we don't know the answer to those questions, is, is the honest answer. Um, the diocese uh, produced a, an anti-racism charter, and we've got as far as turning that into 21 things that we could do. Um, and a lot of that is actually about researching the answer to your question. And it's only once we've done that, we can then start to turn that into actual action. But doing that is an action in itself. And I, and I would and thank you for mentioning that, because um, the lead on racial justice and, and, and the Rad to Racism Charter, is, you know, it, it's for me, and I'm, I always love when I come here because of, I, because of the way things are being contextualized, yeah? Because it's a document that's been produced but it's actually to be lived out at the local. And sometimes maybe the local doesn't know how to live it out, and then that's where we can come in and say, well, we can talk with you, not to tell you, but we can talk with you to say, how is this manifested locally, and, and how can we then work locally to see a change? But so much work is going on here already because you do have um, the group that's set up to, to look into this, and I'm just really, you know, want that almost like example to go out to our other churches who might say, well, we don't know where to begin. We don't know how to have these kind of open and honest conversations. People are fearful of having a conversation where the word race is part of the, the title because they think there's going to be some form of Damocles judgment about them because of the conversation. And actually, as we've been trying to say, this conversation is about we, as made in the image of God, we as children and follow, of God and followers of Jesus Christ, how can we actually create the kingdom of heaven, as it says here, as it is in heaven? How do we do that? And part of how we do that is intentionally looking at where the, where the travesties of, of injustice are and working intentionally to bring about a difference. So what we have to do is equip ourselves with knowledge and we have to be part of that. So I was going to say to you, when you ask the question, I know the diocesan bishop always says, do you have the answer? <laughs> because you ask the question because you want to hear, but actually, I don't sit up here with all the knowledge. You are the local body, and so we need to, if you need to know that answer, you need to be part of finding out locally what that untangling and what it looks like and how it looks to, to start to disentangle. And that's it. just what I was going to say. If that 
having said, come on PCC, that's not the only way to get involved in this. And that if that sort of work is something that makes you think, I'd be interested in being part of that, then let me know. Because it's not a, it's not a formal body, it's not a committee of the PCC or anything like that. It's a group of people who are passionate about this and want to take this forward into action. So if that's you, speak to me. And just let me just say, in terms of, you know, we're the church inside and we're having a conversation amongst ourselves. But remember, millions of people are looking at us. Millions of people are asking, where's the way? What's, how should we live life? What are we going to base life on? And they're looking at one of the last institutions that's really still have a level of trust. And if they can't see something of exemplary, something, a model that they can say, well, they're good because they know how to deal with injustice. They're good because they know how to love each other. They're good because they know how to care for each other. Actually, they're good at practicing what they preach. If we can't demonstrate it, why should they come in and worship with us? One, I remember years ago, we were talking to a group of people, and it just happened I was talking to this Asian guy, Muslim guy, and he said, you know what the problem is? If you Christians would live like Jesus, <laughs> this world would be a far better world. That's what the Muslim guy said to me. I thought, thank you for that, mate. <laughs> 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 You're right. <laughs> um, and, and so we must remember, people are looking. It's not just about us having this conversation and getting uncomfortable, but there are millions of people who are looking at us and if we don't get it right, young people already are leaving the church, okay? Black and white. Yeah. Young people are leaving the church because they're disillusioned. And I'm saying I want to be part of the solution to say to young people, stop. Mom and dad's got it wrong in the past, but we, we recognize that. And, you know, right now we want to move forward. Come on, help me. Help us to, so that the next generation, you and your next generation, could really see it right. So I think that's really important as well, my friend. And so be part of the solution. Yeah, thank you. Um, got space for one more question. Okay. Where is the mic? Um, my name's Sidney Schubert. Um, I want to make up one comment on the previous question, and that is God sees everyone's heart. And that is the starting point and the finishing point of our lives, that we have to walk as he showed us by the Spirit and show exactly, as you've said, that um, we need to um, be an example, a light to the world in that way. Amen. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that gentleman, George, wanted to say something. <laughs> So I think just yeah. I, 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 I'm yes. conscious of the need to be yeah. elsewhere. Sure. Go on then. Go on then. You'll manage. <laughs> 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 they know you. So one thing that stood out for me from the documentary was that power structure that was very present in the early days of um, obviously the parliament, the monarchy, and the church. Now. That obviously went into history to uplift um, or oppress others. Do you feel the church is doing enough or has to do a bit more to segregate from those two powers? Because those two other powers, they don't want to release their power. But in order for church to be seen as a vehicle for justice for all, maybe they need to disentangle themselves from those who don't want to move forward with um, particularly racial justice. There was a conversation, I think it was last year or year before, about the Magna Carta. And there are some people who want to get rid of the House of Lords. And a, a bishop, you know, said that was really powerful. He says, well, these, these guys who want to get rid of the House of Lords and all the bishops and all of this, he says, what did I realize? When you are trying to get rid of that, it's like a vest trying to get rid of this one string out of that vest. What do you do? You dismantle everything. I think it's impossible. There are two things at play. The power of this world, okay, the earthly power, and the power of the kingdom of God who is seeking righteousness, justice, and peace through the spirit of God. 
And I think it's, you know, you're going to always have, you know, the power of this world. And they're part of the church. And let's not just think about the Anglicans, okay? But think of the church. There's some part of the church that wants the power. They're not going to give up anything of that power. But there's part of it that says, actually, we want to see the kingdom of God. And I believe that there's going to be this tension. But I do believe that the ones of the kingdom have got to you know, be a bit more vocal, be a bit more practical, and really stand for justice so that we could see something of God's kingdom shining in this world. We're not seeing enough. Um, and, and I think just to, to say... No, it's not. Um, the, the, and, and that's the... Hold on. And that's the church. That's the church. Because, and, and I'm, a, I'm a very proud Anglican, and, I'm, and I, I really am. This is my history. But the reason I say I'm a proud Anglican, I think like the young woman said at the end of it, I'm a Christian. And this is the history I've inherited, but I feel I have a responsibility and a duty to live out into the future. So I'm not going to abandon the church and say I'm going to find another faith or I'm going to disappear from the Church of England. I stick in the Church of England, maybe sometimes stick in like, a, like, a, like a, uh, something in your, th in your throat. <laughs> maybe, maybe sometimes for some people I might be a blockage. But I am part of the stumbling block that, that the Lord has put there to enable us to be better and different and to, and, 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 and to, to go forward. So I'm not saying, and things like you say, should we be in the, the House of Lords? Well, maybe the next government's going to kick them out anyway. But while the, 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 the bishops stay in the House of Lords, most often they are the ones that are bringing forward the ethical and the moral questions into the House of Lords. They are the ones. You go back and you look at the questions in Parliament and you will see that it's the Anglican bishops that are asking those questions before things go into law. So at this point in time, like that thing that sticks in the neck, the Anglican bishops in the House of Lords are, and the people of faith are staying there as a part of the moral compass that, that so much is falling down around us. And I think that we stay as Christians and as part of the journey because we've been sent by God to play that role. So no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not abandoning being part of the, 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 the public square. I'm not going away from those places of power. I'm going in there and I'm challenging them. And I'm saying... How are you using this power, and is it for the best for the people, for the common good? Is it, are you doing the right by the common good? And that's where I stand, and I think that everybody, as, as, as Brother Les says, we all have a duty where we work, where we are, to take Jesus' message out in terms of working for the common good. All the places we work are potential places of power. What are we doing? to make a difference there. Don't just look at the church. Look outwards. You are the church. You are a living stone. You'd have agency. How are you building on the, the agency you have to change what we see and what we don't like around? Because we know that God doesn't like it. It was going to happen, but I take a slightly different perspective, mm. Bishop Rosemary. Um, I hold on to the church structures very lightly mm -hmm. um, I, uh, <laughs> I received an email because um, I bought a book recently um, and it said the church of tomorrow arriving today came from Amazon <laughs> I thought that's, I hope that's prophetic <laughs> um, and actually in some ways the, the church of tomorrow might look more like the early church than it does the medieval one um, and that is a church which is based on the uh, disciples coming together, breaking bread together, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, and loving one another as Jesus loved them, so that others will see. Yes. And I'm not sure that sits well in the institutional church as we now receive it in the 21st century. Um, I'm, I'm not wishing, <laughs> but I think God may be shaking the church, not just the Church of England, but the church to be more like the church he is, that was established in his name 2,000 years ago. All I'm going to say to you is, human beings are who make up that church. 
And we know that very soon after those wonderful socialistic beginnings, we got the fraction. So we need to recognize within ourselves our capacity for sinfulness and brokenness. And we need to constantly work to, 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 to beg for God's forgiveness and to work for re reconciliation. Seriously. And whether it's whether between our brother and sister churches or whether we talk about the institution of the state, we need to work because we're not very good at it. So I love the image, I love it, but I know the reality is that we set ourselves out as them and us, whatever it is, and if we could stop some of the them and us in, and we can start the we in, then we might truly be building the kingdom that God has called us to be. That's what I, that's what I would say. So I hear you, my brother, and I do think that if he shakes up where we are, that's no problem. He never made a Church of England. He never made a Black Pentecostal Church. He never made none of those. He made people to be his living stones to go out as apostles and evangelists, as preachers and teachers, to live out the kingdom. That's what he, that's what he set us and, out and, and to do. And getting worldly power may have been one of the worst things that happened to the church ever. Yeah, yes. right. which is why I said about the third yeah. century. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everyone, I'm just thank you. Thank you for your questions. If you did have a question and weren't able to ask it, um, please be aware that this is not the end of the conversation, that this is just something to help spark up the fact that these are things that we need to converse about. Let's not hide behind the challenging questions. Let's not hide behind ruffling feathers. Let's, let's not hide or be afraid of getting messy because Jesus came into the world messy. Everyone who knows about childbirth knows that that's messy, but out of it is life. And that's what Jesus promised, life in all its fullness. And let's, let's move towards that together as one body, as one united church. Um, just to summarize, I would like to ask one final question of the panelists. We started with the documentary sharing about the curse of Ham and the story of Noah. But we know that the end of that story in the Bible talks about the rainbow and the, the dove and the olive branch as signs of hope, signs of peace, and signs of safety. What is our rainbow of hope coming out of this conversation? Mine's a very simple one. It is this conversation. It is this conversation. What Rosemary said. Mm. 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 Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, we were going to have a worship song at the end. I think we probably used that time up. Sorry, Grant. Um, but. Thank you to all of our panellists, including our chair, um, for today. I think another round of applause for our guests today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for staying. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for engaging. And thank you for what you will be doing as we go from this place. And Amen. if you have any suggestions, anything that you think the diocese, not the church only, needs to hear or to reflect on, like your conversation about investments and so on and so forth, get in touch with me. You know how to get hold of me. It's really easy. So just do have a conversation. I'm really open. Second time I've been here on this kind of conversation. I'm really open. I want to have more conversations, and I want to work collaboratively. Um, so please do just, you know... Be, be in touch, yeah? So, just one more key point. Um, so, the film was produced um, with support and grants that are available, but the Movement for Justice and Reconciliation wants to continue this work more than just this film. There's big plans um, to really get this conversation out in the wider public, to raise awareness of some of the challenges and some of the issues. And so, their details are up on the slide. Um, can I please encourage you to, to consider supporting them financially? Um, go to their website and um, look at what they want to do and where they're moving. And if you think this could be a film that can be shown in your context, 
get in contact with them because I would love to kind of allow, allow showings of this to spread wider. So thank you all. Thank you. All right. thank you. What time are you supposed to be at no, your... No, no.